One time I heard a story of a great rabbi, who his name I do not know. But he explained in this life we have many different people, many different cultures. Right here where we are, we have two very certain cultures, Palestinians and Jewish Israelis. What he explained is that we have on our right side the Jewish people. We have on our left side the Arab people. And together, it makes together. Together, it makes sound. Together, it makes music. Together, make harmony. And only together will there not be war. But now, Ready, my friend? I went to Israel to explore our belief. To find a way how people can share visions, help exist together happily. Hidden fear were what I did not comprehend. I know peace is a word most common in the vocabulary of conflict groups, but it's such a great concept. Why wouldn't it be? was my question. Religious reasons bring Jews, Muslims and Christians to Jerusalem, where the Temple of Solomon was, the burial place of Christ and the place from where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And that's the case for centuries. People want to go there to connect with God. In the Holy Land, 760 kilometers of dividing wall were built lately, and children on the opposing sides do not consider playing together, or that they ever will. Both Israelis and Palestinians want to be there equally strong. It is telling how actions are justified by negativity and how your own wishes, wished by others, could be dismissed. What I found is a variety of ways people find peace or fight for it. A Palestinian flag waving in the distance. Behind the wall, the wall is a barrier wall so that the Arabs cannot shoot into Israel, onto Israeli cars that are traveling on this road. Behind the wall, you see a Palestinian flag. The Palestinian flag represents the state of Palestine, which does not, from my point of view, exist. They do not have an economy. They do not have a banking system. They do not have anything that they export other than terror. <laughs> We are uh, small people in a small place. All the Arab world want to kill, all the Muslims want to kill us. I have no problems with any people. No Muslim, no Jewish, just the racist ones. Oh, this, you heard this? This was, uh, there is a base. It's five kilometers from here. It's a tank base that, uh, unfortunately, we, it's pretty close to us. So we live in with the sounds of the machine guns and the tanks and the bombing. Everyone in Israel, when they turn 18, they go to the army. And everyone gets a gun. M16, it's an automatic rifle. In this rifle, you have two selections. The trigger, you can push once, and it shoots. Or, there's a different selection, where you push the trigger once, and it does... Very fast, so you can kill all the enemies at once. And they train you to use this gun in the army. No, I don't like this. Nobody like this. I can give myself more than to live here and to be a Jew and to be a citizen of Israel. I like it here. Really like it. Space is special, special, and every person I meet is good. Jerusalem is the head of the happiness. Jerusalem is the city of God because it's a holy city. We live in Jerusalem all our life, and we hope peace will be for everyone.
My first night in Jerusalem, I was very fascinated to see that the human's capacity to feel joy was the same, even though there was a conflict, and pleasure of life was not less contagious. The army training had not damaged people's skills to have fun. Bless you, <laughs> Life is beautifully fucked up. I like it. This is a charanguito, this is a charango, this is a charanguito, and this is a charango. This is to play it to make a people smile. Keep people free. This is a charanguito, this is a charango, tropical sound or tropical. Oh. This is a charanguito, this is a charango, to make the people smile. Smoke grass here in the streets, sitting everyone, drinking, smoking, punks, metal freaks, sitting here in the street. Now, Jerusalem make become more high class place, a place for more high society, gold and silver. <laughs> First you give money. No, ten shekel I want. I yes, I want ten shekel. I need. I need ten shekel. In the old city, I met some. His name meant the man destined to fix things wrong. Muslim people believe that the number of names of God are written on our hands to remind us of him, but on Sam's hands the lines were crossing in a way neither me nor him had ever seen before. So for 15 years he was living in his shop in Jerusalem asking everyone he meets why. I meet a lot of people, a thousand or millions of people. I never, nobody entered to my place and he when he leave, he's not happy. I lose. But also I sometimes I'm not losing. So this with this it will be fair. I'm not losing, and both of way I win. People often ask me, what do I do here? Well, I don't do that much, but I say hello to people a lot. Probably to hundreds of people each day. I'm, gre I'm greeting people. I'm giving people good. Every time I say good morning, I'm giving you good. Good, good, good. I hope it makes you feel better. <laughs> Love you! Love you! Tell anybody about anything, tell it in a nice way. Fight oh. nice. <laughs> Don't boom. Boom. I'm going to tell you about hummus. Hummus is a food that we eat here a lot in Israel. I don't understand why we can eat hummus together. Because we all like hummus. We all eat hummus. They're eating hummus over there. We're eating hummus over there where we can sit around the table and have a hummus party. And when we look at the conflict and we say, oh, how they should be doing this, I don't know that I have much uh, insight for them or how it should happen. I do know that um, if I look for peace within me, then I can see, I can see within me all the things that I have within me that are objecting to peace. <laughs>
respect, be nice, don't be angry. That's it. This is the best trick. It's obvious, it's obvious who's being disrespectful. Uh, the Jewish people, we keep uh, giving Palestinian people land. Every time we try to make peace, and every time we give them a little bit of land to Israel. And every time they promise us peace in return for the land. And every time that we give them land, there's war afterwards again. What you just heard is a common Israeli narrative. But if we look at the map, we can see clearly that it is the Jewish people who keep taking land rather than giving. A couple of times Israel has offered land in exchange for peace. That has been refused and followed by war. But the outcome of every war is that Israel grows bigger, all the way to the present day when there is three-fourths of a million Jewish settlers living in the territories given to Palestine by the United Nations. The problem not with the space. The space enough maybe for Palestinians. For if they bring more, more. If they want to bring all the Jews from everywhere, people from the outside, from their land to another land, it's not enough for anyone. Yet. There's so much room in Israel and everyone's fighting over who has where to live. Why don't they just live here? It's called magic all one soap. Who else but God gave man love that can spark mere dust to life? Poetry, uniting all one. All if I'm not for me, who am I? Nobody. Second, yet, if I'm only for me, what am I? Nothing. Third, if not now, when? In the Arab communities, the police work against gangs and against drugs inside the Arab communities. They don't do anything about thefts outside of the communities. Like if I steal, a, if I'm an Arab and I steal a car in Tel Aviv and I bring it into the community, they don't care about that. This is all people that died from the terror attacks. Each page for one person that's passed away. These are the ants, see? We're past the green line between Bethlehem and Hebron. This here building is a place that was donated by the people of the communities here. And they give them tea and cookies and all the nice things for the soldiers for free. So that when the soldiers are resting, they can eat for free. It's also thanking the soldiers because without the soldiers, we will not be living here. This place is called the Dodot. It's meaning in English, the ants. Because the ants are donating the cookies and the tea and they're taking care of the soldiers. So it's like the ants of the soldiers. When we're cold, we come. It's how it was, it's how it will be. Also, not knowing why, how, and what. There are brave souls who dare to dream that men are brothers and not foes. And it's fair for life. Fair for life. all one or none. Guaranteed. Sometimes in my tears I drown, but I never let it get me down. So my negativity surrounds. I know someday it'll all turn around because all my Bible in the Torah, which people learn here in Israel, the, it starts with a story about the tree. In this tree, there is good and there is evil. If you eat from the tree, there will be good and evil. And now, here in Israel, we have good and we have evil. So let's go inside. <laughs> Each page we get a wall. Each leader tells them what to make on the wall. This is a room. Here the kids do not come. This is where the leaders come. The leaders come here and they meet and they talk. And what will we do with the kids? <laughs> You're ostracized if you don't send your child out to throw stones. So they have a hold on their people. 
you have the mullahs, which are like the religious leaders, and then you have underneath them the politicians, and then the politicians, then you have the clan leaders. So the mullahs say this is the way it should be, you know, from you know the Quran. And then underneath them you have the politicians who are saying, well, this is how we're going to interpret the, the Quran for the mullahs so that they have to get their way. So what, what the end result is, is the people at the bottom are suffering. Just much like in the Middle Ages, where you had the castle and the warlords, that you have to pay money to the warlords to work. For example, an Arab in this community here has to pay the clan leader money if he wants to work in Israel. It's a bribe. They have no money to pay them with, so they have to promise them a portion of their wages each month so that they can go to work to make more money to raise their standard of living. Well, you have to understand something, and that is that the Palestinians have no real economy themselves. They have grapes, their clan mentality. So the, this clan here owns this grape field. That clan owns that grape field. There's no GNP. There's no, how do you say, sending out, exporting of goods and services like most countries. The Palestinians' economy is relying totally on help from Europe, Saudi Arabia, to pay back wages, to pay their workers. They have no income. They don't generate their own income. Water containers, this is the way you make the difference between a Palestinian house and an Israeli house. Always a Palestinian house has a container of water for, for uh, having a reserve of water because uh, Palestinian family, they are used uh, to open the tap and there is no water, so they need always a kind of reserve. So if you look at the settlement, you won't find this kind of reserve. Have you tried their water? No, but they, but they haven't tried mine either. They try to steal mine, but they don't. So explanation what is happening about shares of water. In Palestine, they have 36 liter of water every day per inhabitant. In the settlements, they have over 500 liters of water per inhabitant per day. And in Israel, they have 360 liters of water per inhabitant per day. So this explains how much water is important and in the same time explain how big is the Palestinian economy and who is controlling it. So in fact, the economy is the water. If I want to produce a flower, I need 15 liters of water. Well, Israel sells dates, sells orange, sells banana to Europe, to a private companies. It means the state of Israel is selling the Palestinian and the Israeli water. And they don't have any real money, banking system. So the people are poor, for example. <clears throat> An Israeli worker working for me, I have to pay about $120 a day with all the services. A Palestinian working for me, and he thinks that I'm gold, he works for me for about $35 a day. Plus I give him lunch, and I give him whatever. I give him the... He works from 7.30 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon for $35 plus lunch. And he's happy. Why? Because if he works in his own village, he only makes $20 a day. Um, we here, Jews who live in this West Bank, hire Arabs, and they love us. I don't have, like the policy of the uh, settlement. Uh, the legal settlements, as I understood, are the reason and the thing that makes the Palestinian people the most angry because these are the materialized manifestations of the promises that the Jewish people made but it's never realized actually. You know why does the Koah deal was settled? Because there were two kids from the Koah who went to play there. There, exactly there. And the um, Arabs from the village here killed them with rocks. Yeah. So after that, the people here said, if you kill us, we are going to take our land. That's all. 
So it's not so easy. Everything here is complicated. It's not complicated. No, I feel that they stole our land. We talk about the freedom of the movement. Movement through this land. You, you see the land here near that settlement. All, all the land near the settlement, it's uh, military, military, under military uh, control. Oh, everybody, he wants to go to work in Israel. He needs permission. I'm from Hebron. I want to visit that church because it's a holy place. Some people, he take permission. Some people, he not take permission. Sometimes they check people. If they have Israeli ID or Palestinian ID. So if they have Palestinian ID, they take them to the police station and after that they send them to the Palestine. They cannot stay here. Don't like to make any contact with the Arab. They make apartheid war. My father, he can come because he also has a Georgian passport. But my brother and sister, no. I am, I am forbidden to go to them. To them. It's like they tell you, you, together, you see the sign here. You see the sign here. It's forbidden for Israeli people to go inside. This is before 20, 25 years. We don't see, uh, see this sign. Right now, if a policeman comes and catches me here and finds out that I'm Israeli, he can point a gun to my head and take me. Yeah. It's the green line. I've just been to Herod's Palace that is um, covered by a hill and you enter inside it through, si through spiral circling around the hill and inside I met two workers renovating it. The difference for me was one of them was with the gun, the other was not here on my side. You can see the walls, flags, uh, towers and big guns of the uniformed Israelis and just on the other side of the road what is in between are four ropes that are used for protection in case of attack. You stand behind them with your rifle and you're ready to shoot. And people living here use them for display of their opinion of how they see the situation as possibility to have their voice. The Israeli they make this like a... Excuse me, you should have to ask not political questions. Because you ask it, ask it, you ask it, we will answer for you, no problem. We will get a problem maybe. Palestinian person, he said he cannot speak. He said he's not allowed to have a, to say his opinion here. He just told me, Go on the other side, people, they're free, they're educated, they can tell you what they think. Are you going to say something about the conflict? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Being in a historical site in the Palestinian territories next to Jewish settlement, I saw the fear. The Israeli government does not allow its citizens to go to the peace shop in Palestine because of fear. And the Palestinians are scared to talk because they think all the settlers carry weapons. Jews, when they're subject to terror attacks, they think they should surround themselves with fences and soldiers. And when the Palestinians see those fences and soldiers, they're reminded that their land has been taken away and they start protesting in the most simple way they can, throwing stones. On the way out of this area, after speaking with two well-educated, interesting old men, I met their children. And what their children did was trying to sell all of their toys to me for a dollar. And when I refused to do this and asked the question why and what is the reason for their action, they didn't know and they had no way to say it, say it even if they did because they didn't know English language. And to my, to my sayings of uh, peace and importance of people over profit, the reaction was of one of them was taking his stone from the ground and pointing it towards me and looking at me angry as I already did something different to me rather than giving me fight. Go in, uh, <laughs> in a dark tunnel. Why? <laughs> Why? 
because we are in the cooperation under the cooperation political <laughs> It's not your job. You are in another place, you can keep it for your speaking free for yourself. After seeing the weapons and prohibitions and fear from the other, I was lucky enough to witness a Palestinian reaching out to an Israeli with the flower in his hand. Here you can see the alternative, rather than separating ourselves and remembering the thefts and deaths and reacting in response to this negative past, people can provoke good reactions. This simple, beautiful moment clearly illustrates the great power of reaching out with good intention, how good gestures can have the capacity to generate smiles and more goodness. We like to speak, some people who don't like to speak. You understand me? But the situation here, not, not, not bad. Not bad, it's medium. Not bad, not good. Today is worse than yesterday. Yesterday was better than today. And tomorrow, I'm sure it's going to be worse than today. This is how it is since the beginning, since I opened my eyes. I arrived to Balata and Ida refugee camps to understand what the collective management means. Two days ago, the Israeli army has been in the camp searching for the three missing um, Israeli kids kidnapped on the 12th of 12th of June. To punish the Palestinians for the kidnapping, the army had connected pipes to the sewage system and has sprayed shit all over the walls of the camp and on the, even on the cultural center. The smell was horrendous. Probably no, no one from the perpetrators of the kidnapping was among the people who had to live with the terrible smell. Do you think that the whole group of people should be made to suffer because of the crimes of individuals? And what possible reactions could this torment provoke? A person throws a bottle from this village over here at me. My point is, is that nobody from that village should be able to work in my community until they police their own. But they don't police their own. You see this building here that's all burned down? This is an ancient building here that was partially destroyed because they were shooting at Jews from up top here. So the army came in and destroyed it. As we come down here to the bottom, this is another empty lot that used to have houses on it. You can see the outline on the of right. one of the walls. It was, these were the walls of the house that stood here uh, that was destroyed. These all are homes that were destroyed by the Israeli army because they were shooting at Israelis from the rooftops and so forth. Well, the Israeli army was definitely in the camps to cause suffering, to punish the Palestinians for what happened. Uh, two nights ago, we had more than a thousand uh, Israeli soldiers coming into the refugee camp while the people were sleeping and going into the houses and arresting people, destroying the properties, destroying the houses, you know, looking for guns or whatever they were looking for and making life like hell for the people here. And uh, nobody really understands. We are uh, inside the house of uh, uh, Yasser Arafat. Yes, his name is Yasser Arafat. That's his name. And he's a uh, Palestinian security uh, official, a lieutenant. Uh, that's his house. It uh, was exposed to the Israeli search two nights, uh, two nights ago. And. Uh, He is. He is an officer. He's a high rank officer. You know? And uh, it's funny because he had training with the, uh, the Americans and, you know, he was just giving to him as a gift from his American community. He was nothing, he was nobody. I agree that violence is sometimes needed for resistance. Yes, indeed. But the appropriate amount of violence for resistance is the one that is proportionate to the injustice. Honestly, what can you expect from all those kids whose homes were destroyed? I don't want to hear justification for this violence. I don't see any other result that the Israeli army could achieve except having more families wanting revenge. It is exactly these acts that put the Jewish people in danger of terror attacks. In their very self, the purpose of a gun is not to protect, it's to attack. 
Isn't it obvious that the only thing that acts of aggression bring is more aggression? If you don't want to have rocks thrown on you, don't destroy homes. Last night, Israeli came uh, to the refugee camp looking for wanted people and pieces of arms. Uh, as we see here, the damage they left after them. We see that they placed a bomb here on the floor uh, to uh, knock down the walls because I think they were thinking that things are hidden in the wall. As we see here, this wall completely uh, knocked down and this wall completely disappeared here. And we see also that the, the, the building it's, uh, it's, it's really dangerous to live in this building. Yes. They shoot on it? Man, they put a bomb. Assalamu alaikum. They put a bomb. You can no worry. They are going to make an explosion. Yeah, bomb. Uh, and uh, so they placed the bomb here exactly where we stand. The window. Yeah, here. Yeah. They So this family. They arrested uh, the this place. Lo, uh, boom. It's 27. Uh, and boom. In the most recent numbers we have, it is 56% unemployment rate in, uh, in the camp. Uh, more than 73 or 74% of Balata here under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. Unemployment rate among the youth, 16 years to 29 or 30, it is more than 70%. Balata here also uh, has the reputation of being the most politically active refugee camp also in, uh, in the area. The story of the camp is the same story of all the refugee camps inside Palestine and outside Palestine. It goes back to 1948 after the establishment of the State of Israel and uh, of course the defeat of the Arabs at that time and the outcome that uh, came after or during the war that more than 800,000 Palestinians lost their homes in the historic of Palestine that became the State of Israel and uh, they became refugees. For two years, there was no situation for uh, the refugees. They were just staying anywhere, in the mountains, in, I don't know, in a cave, in a school, in a church, any place. By the end of uh, 1949, the United Nations started to work on the ground and established all the Palestinian refugee camps in the uh, four locations. Of course, the idea that this is a temporary situation, you know, until the conflict is over, there is a, a political solution for the situation. <coughs> And they were all hoping that they will just go home, end up going home to where they came, uh, came from. Uh, the number of people living in Balata was growing all the time because, you know, we, the Arabs, we like these, so we use a lot and we don't stop procreating, you know? And uh, the population was increasing all the time. And after 66 years of being refugees and living in the refugee camps, uh, Balata is still where it is, still a refugee camp, and uh, still located on one square kilometer that includes everything in the camp, the houses, the streets, the alleyways, the mosques, the schools, the house. I have an Arab worker that works for me, and he has a house in Bethlehem, but he chooses to live in a refugee camp. Why? Because he doesn't have to pay, in Bethlehem you have to pay for electricity and you have to pay for water. In the refugee camp you don't pay for anything. Uh, this is of course one of the main problems that we have to deal with, that it is totally overcrowded and a lot of people living in this very small area, which can create a lot of problems, you know, economical, social, health. Most of the houses are dark, you cannot enter, uh, I mean, the sun cannot get into the house. So he rents that out to get money, to get income, at a higher rate, right? And his wife's family, they... Yeah, with 70 people of the same family living all together in the same uh, house, all open, windows open, doors open. You can hear, you can see, I mean, it's just an open book lifestyle, you know, that uh, exposes the life of everybody to everybody.
explain to you can well met in guys gentlemen sitting next to me I asked them where are you from I was they were saying uh, I'm not in Palestine this means like I'm from Palestine I've been with my parents my sister we all we all felt the same shock we felt that we kind of the Nazis for them good uh, good way to announce it like that because I saw my father that is really I think for me it's a very uh, important uh, personality and I'm really really learned from him a lot and I saw how he was terrifying and he was like really afraid and then we start to mumble in like uh, we, 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 we are from a uh, uh, we really was a little bit felt uncomfortable. We said that we are from Israel. Then we, st- they felt uncomfortable as well, and they like start speaking in Arab. I think they said a couple of things about us and kind of stopped talking. But slowly, slowly, we, I tried, we tried to contact them. And we just discover very nice people. I, I don't think you need to say extremely amazing. It's never mind, we saw people in our eyes. They live in very bad condition back then in Palestine. And it infects them 100%. It's like, I guess that if most of the Israeli was in a bad condition, didn't have money and food to eat, so we were maybe treat, treat them as the same way they treat us. We don't feel any kind of a threat in here. I think it's one of the reasons that we chose this specific place. Think, talking about the conflict, it's very, very silent area. It's actually on a mountain. And it's not close to any, close to Jordan. Jordan is very silent. So they understand immediately that we need a peaceful place that will be not connected. Yes, even there will be like a chaos in the country barely feeling here. My name is Aviv Goni. I grew up in this kibbutz desert, which called Neotoda. The closest Nodar. city is uh, 30 something minutes from here. It's a lot. It's the southest city in Israel. So actually we're almost in the end of Israel. We're very close to Jordan and Egypt. Basically the kibbutz give you all the basic stuff you need. There is a dining room which all the kibbutz is eating together, the volunteers, the natives, the people that build the kibbutz, we eat together and uh, it also provides you a place to live, a room, a house, it provides you a car if you need to take a ride somewhere, a gas. You don't deal with money actually when you're in the kibbutz. Lots of cigarettes, packets are just where it's for someone to take them and the thought about money is disappearing in some point of just when you go outside you understand that that's what the world works on it but in the kibbutz it's beyond but lots of people they left 25 years ago they left their places they left their houses they left their and one night they just decide they're gonna move to the desert something like 70 people and uh, lots of them had uh, how, and I will explain why it's a little bit different. The cities, most of the world, but you just want to get out. Mount yeah, Madara was one of the most paradoxical places I visited in my journey. On one side, I know that if people were understanding and living life the way they do there, there was going to be no violence. On the other, I know that what they do there does not protect people. It's beautiful what they're managing to create in the desert. They say they don't use money, but all this generates profit. Israel is full of those calm, secluded places where people live life of real values and love. But why is this love not reaching everyone? 
Is it possible to reach complete happiness while there is someone there in pain? In front of my eyes, I saw what the kibbutz members have created, learning through work about peace, harmony and help. 20 minutes from a tank's training base, in the heat of the desert, they try to cre create the perfect environment to stay. The Arts and Crafts Center is a novel vision, beautifully realized through working together and sharing of the effort. Very much. secret place for a good gallery. Um. Decisions about the um, symbols that are there, it's been really purely aesthetics. There isn't really anything. That's what I've been told by Galit, who is one of the founders here. You see the peacocks on the window? Peacocks are very important as the last phase of transition from when light becomes into colors and variety. And it is accepted in for the multitude, you know, manifestation. Do you like paintings and owls? It is just, you know, the whole way that we work here is there's uh, every team, there'll be a leader and there'll be the supporters. So, um, so let's say there's been a team to design the banister. So the team who designed the banister, the leader would have said, Let's go with this design, and then everybody support. I and mean, maybe if they didn't like it, they could say, maybe to look at something else. That could, the question is, how do you say such a thing in a way to be supportive rather than opposing? Basically, we start the day in 5:30. We sit 30 minutes in quiet. Sometimes someone brings a guitar or. A Plays in the morning, no one barely speaks. We're sitting quiet. Look on the sun in the summer, it's already daylight in 5 30 in the morning. And then in 6 we start. But we're trying to see like what you can do with the land, what you can do with the. we really connected to the land. We have here. Through the walk, through the building of this amazing place, we learn a lot about ourselves about the other how does our mind work why we judge why we jealous why we hate why we scared really trying to understand how to be how to be better with themselves and between one of uh, and another so in here we decide that we will not talk publicly or use publicly phone, like any kind of phone, any kind of phone conversation, uh, text, just don't put out the phone. So, this is what the place asks you for. Yesterday, as we were sitting in uh, the room in the kibbutz, a group of kids jumped fast inside and started touching everything. And when they asked them what they're doing, they said that eating meat is illegal because it's not kosher. So they're using Aviv's room while he's gone to eat some chicken. I think one of the problems that we aim to be fear. As a Israeli, I have good to fear. I've grew up with the, they taught me in school about the Holocaust and they took most of my friends to Poland. I mean, specifically decided not to go because I don't want to live life of fear of, because uh, I don't think it help anyone. It just fear brings you, you getting far from the thing instead of meeting them. Meet. Not a single decision in this life should be determined by fear. Fear is a very low vibration with a limited capacity for achievement. What should determine our decisions is our hopes and dreams, our good intentions and visions, 
and these days you can you can understand that there is a base for the field. My daughter, when she will be 16 or 12, go downtown with friends and say hello to one of the friends, and after two minutes to, there will be a bump and someone will be killed. So, for example, three days ago, three Israeli been kidnapped. It could be me, because a couple of months ago, two months ago, I've been in the same junction and took the same each eye. Could be Palestinian terrorists as well. So, like, I mean, like, it's, it's logical that we go with the fear, but we need to learn to, you need to teach the next generation how to love and avoid the fear and understand there is people in the other side of the. Believing in people, it's what makes them much more responsible and good. The only way for someone to learn to do good is to be demonstrated good actions. And the attitude that everyone deserves everything is what makes people much more worthy. And the conflict started because of a misunderstanding between the sides and unable to talk. I think one of the most things that help the conflict that we don't learn Arabic in school, for example. I think it's also insulting them that we use Akhla, uh, Sababa, like of course, like Yef, Anan, like everything is cool, like in Arab, or cursing. That's the only words 90% of the Israeli use, just the curse and the, the nice, like the Fanan, like chilling. Sababa, it's like all good. I'm, I'm cool. So it's kind of. I think it's, it can be insult that they like we used as a joke, as a curse. They hear, I guess, lots of Arabs been through in the streets and they hear in Israeli people curse in Arab because we curse each other in Arab, not in Hebrew mostly. The hate between the sides just grow. And I'm sure even the fighters, the terrorists, I'm sure I can see the kid inside that do it because he's not complete, he's trying to be strong and to recover his weakness. I still believe there are also the terrorist uh, groups, the, there were people that just followed the wrong way and they didn't have choice, some of them. They were very weak, very afraid. They didn't have nothing to lose. So when a person don't have something to lose, he, he loses his life, he kills people. He, he can do whatever he wants because he, he's in the lowest place of his soul, of his uh, conscience. Arabs and, and Jews are actually good business partners. Some of them are friends, but inside them, many of them, not all, they learn from the, from, from the get-go, since they were children, from their school, from their imams, 
to hate Jews and to destroy Jews. They don't want us to exist here. It's really simple. They start to, to learn their children. Yeah? You are Jewish, you are Arab, want to kill you or to throw them, you out. Jewish, I don't love Jewish. Can't stop them. Uh, they would like to destroy uh, us in Israel. That is their intent. That Israel should be destroyed, wiped off the map. When I was small, I thought that it's everywhere, well, like everyone will accept the other life of, of the other and everything uh, and leave one on the side of the other. But now we know that it won't. It, I'm not in the place where they like difference, eh? No, they like everyone to be like them. They want the Muslim to rule the world. Allah, this tone that they say, how they say it, it sounds like go and kill, go and conquer. And there's big speakers and Everyone in the area is hearing this prayer, and it's like, yeah, wow, it's like uh, the tone, the tone. It's not a pleasant sound, like, have a nice day, enjoy, go and go. It's uh, going into my head. Go now, we are Muslim, our God is the best. It's not nice, and it's very scary. It makes me feel like they want to all come and kill me. And that's what it is. What you just heard is um, a view widely shared by many Jewish people who don't speak Arabic and are culturally conditioned not to be able to appreciate the mystical frequencies of the mosque. But if this is what really people think, then it is relevant and I think it should be shown. So I think I will be Muslim for one week. I will read this Quran and I will be Muslim. Okay. Although I find mocking what you don't understand a very disturbing practice, I think it is much better um, to laugh at difference rather than to hate it or fear it. The Quran, a terrible punishment. There are some who say we believe in God and the last day, yet they are not believers. They seek to deceive the God and the believers, but they only deceive themselves. God will requ requiet them for their mockery and draw them on for a while, to wander blindly in their insolence. Such are those who have taken misguidance in exchange for guidance. The Quran is a book which brings glad tidings to mankind, along with divine admoni admonition, stresses the importance of a man's discovery of truth on both spiritual and intellectual planes. Every book has its objective, and the objective of this Quran is to make man aware of the creation plan of God. I, I was um, curious to hear the Jewish interpretation of the Quran, not as a way of understanding Islam, but rather I see that focusing on the main misconceptions that one side has towards the other is um, a very good way to change them for understanding. And in Judaism, there is a very, very big belief in, the, in correcting your ways, uh, returning to God. To become religious is called returning to God. Any person can return to God even if he has done the most awful thing in the world. Whoever admits and leaves the sins will be mercy, mercied by God. In the Quran though, in this chapter we just read, which is the first chapter, it's, it's really the opening of the Quran, it talks about the people who will never be believers. They have no re redemption, they have no, they will always be deceivers, they are liars, and they don't even know that they are liars there because God has sealed their hearts. That's exactly what it, it said in these words. Well, the first chapter of the Quran actually says, 
is that if one opens the book not with pure heart and not in search of truth, he would not be able to understand it in its completeness. And what he will do is pick particular chapters and segments and he would inevitably receive misguidance. Some people should pay because they are bad people. In other words, which means that the, the Islam is also about the believers, but the non-believers who have no redemption should be punished very badly. In these words, they said a very bad punishment, which could be interpreted in whoever doesn't believe in God or Muhammad should be should have a very big punishment. And I remind you again, this is the first chapter of the Quran also says that. Um, God is one. He's the unconditional love. So Allah loves people so much that he is inevitably going to give them what they want. Even in the cases this is misguidance or punishment. But it is interesting how non-Muslims find in the Quran the explanation for the terror attacks. Probably in the same way as terrorists do but they both misinterpret the holy text. This misunderstanding brings the fear of the other and provokes the terror attacks. I think that solution is to understand each other so well that you cannot impose blame on the other and to be doing only good things, to be free of the guilt that provokes the exaggerated violent responses. For the Jewish people, they need to understand that the violent attacks by Palestinians are their means of resisting against an injustice. And that there is an injustice coming from the politics of the State of Israel. The Muslims, they need to understand that the Jewish people need a home and they deserve to have one in this place and they can, they can make a very good living in it. More communication, more understanding and more sharing. It does sound like a simple recipe, but it does because it is. One of the main issues of the conflict is that they admire murder in the other side. They give murder a place. And there it says, Messiah screams. Israel is ours without giving up. Demolish all the terrorists that are standing in the front immediately. In small print in the bottom, it says, it is important to finish this perfectly. If not, there will only be more killings. If you see a Jew behind a, a tree, stone him, kill him. The law of the Torah says that if a Jewish person and a Christian person are falling from a cliff and I happen to be Jewish, it's better for me to save the Jewish person than the Christian person. For Israel, uh, the solution is to uh, be powerful and take over the land and be stewards in the land for all the rest of the people. So you are now in Kibbutz Ein Gedi. A kibbutz in Israel is a very special thing. And it used to be a long time ago that people in the kibbutz, they all work together in order to make the kibbutz stay alive. Each kibbutz has different things that they make. Some of them make flowers. Some of them make water and trees. And that's what they make the money on. And of course from tourists. For the wine, the blessing for the wine. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Korei Kori Hakafel. It's for you. Oh, it's so many. Lately, in the past few years, the kibbutz turned into a econo economical terror, and this happened because people became more greedy. People wanted to be more in charge of the kibbutz. The ego came along 
and controlled the kibbutzim. And this ruined the unity and the love and the harmony that was in the Where kibbutz. Where Gedi makes a huge profit from tourism and from selling water. But no matter what is happening beyond its borders or within its organization, for a visitor, it still feels But like it heaven on earth. It's like a joke. It's that capitalistic part takes over the idealistic part because the capitalistic part makes more money. People become more greedy when it's capitalistic. The stronger survive. The more strong you are, the more you survive. Wow. Could you give us a ride? <laughs> We are in a kibbutz called En Gedi. It's uh, in the middle of the Dead Sea. Uh, above uh, our boat stream, which is the river that you see down there. It's usually dry, but when it rains, it's flooded. The nature here is so intense compared to any other place in Nigeria. Yeah, I have a trail leading up to the mountains from my house. I take it every day, you don't make it ours. Sit and unwind and absorb all of this. It gets old, really. Living here, I feel a little disattached from everything that's not The emotions are a lot stronger. This really sucks you in. When people from, from abroad ask about the world, it's really because you never know the answer. On one hand, you serve time in the military. On the other hand, now that you're not there, you, you understand how much there shouldn't be any military at all. And you really feel it strongly. But this place was uh, dedicated to a soldier named Doma. He was from this community. I guess he used to sit here. We are here to make the big concern to defend. They bring feeling safe for the kids. I'm really hoping for peace. I think it's way beyond me. I don't know what's holding us back. I, I guess it's other interests that none of us, that are beyond all of us, and none of us really know the source. But yeah, I guess everyone would be better off. No, I don't guess, I'm sure. Actually. I guess if people that was talking and see life as we see it in here, it, would, it could take the, the conflict to an, another step. And we, we are ready to give up on land as understanding that Peace is more important than a, than a land. I think we have a new land. It's the virtual land. One country for both population. We can't throw them out, or they can't throw us out. The average in Palestinian, I believe, wants peace. It's the government, the politicians, the people that come for money, the people that are taking bribes from government officials that are making it bad for everybody else. That's the problem. I feel the political must change their idea before they start looking for peace. 
So if we share it equally, the water here, people will be a lot more calm than, than today. Give thanks to the Lord and call out his name. Make known his wonders throughout all the lands and tell all the nations of the world about all the wonderful things. That's the words of that song. This is a paragraph from the Bible. It says here, generation coming, generation going, and the land forever is standing. And the sun is shining, and the sun is coming, and to the place it's breathing, and he is shining, there, going, to the south, and around, to the north, and around, and around, goes the wind. And on this ground, the wind sits. This is, we'll put it uh, in the Saudi Arabic, okay? This is, if they are, they are not making noise, the Christian uh, people. So, just to move it in the side, here I want a lot of burgers. <laughs> there is some flour, you can make uh, ropes from the flowers, <coughs> and uh, then you can make sandals from them. <laughs> Hey! 